So uh, next up, I want to uh, invite uh, Herman uh, Balsers uh, on stage um, because I think there's, uh, I mean, uh, for 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 me as a a, a human being, uh, I, I I think it's it's quite. Um, challenging to, to understand what uh, a, a lawyer, of course also a human being, but a, a lawyer uh, understands, <laughs> a, a lawyer understands from, from, from all the laws and jurisdictions and, and, and uh, the material available. Um, and, uh, and then there's the world of software developers. And that's a, a, another realm. A, and how can we connect the world of, of users, of entrepreneurs who want to accomplish new goals uh, with their software, with uh, people who actually understand what ha what's happening in the legal space as well as in the, in the software space. And Herman uh, is working on, on a solution for that. So uh, an applause for, for him, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Rutger. Um, the title of my talk is Why Legal Issues Need a Semantic Blockchain. And what I want to talk about is uh, some notions, some concepts. Um, what are smart contracts and what are smart legal contracts? And what makes a smart contract legal? And there's an important issue, and that is uh, the issue of code as a contract. Uh, I want to make a claim that uh, the notion of a so-called semantic blockchain is necessary in order to come up with correct blockchain solutions, especially in the, uh, the legal context. And I also want to make a proposal. I think that a so-called controlled natural language could um, perform the, uh, the um, important role of a facilitary intermediate language, bridging the gap between the domain expert, in this case the lawyer, and uh, the software developer. And I also want to show you a particular solution in this uh, solution space. I'm going to present a language called Olay, from, from Objects, Logic, and English, as a, an example of a controlled natural language for writing smart contracts. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a uh, computer scientist, a mathematician, a linguist. I'm also an associate professor at the Faculty of Economics and Business in Groningen, so I'm also a business analyst. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an innovator, I'm a director, founder of a company called Integrand.info, and I work on this, these, this, these intermediary problems, be, trying to bridge the gap between the user, the domain expert, and the software developer. Well, first of all, uh, smart contracts, are they smart? I would say no. Uh, it's grossly overrated. To, uh, to, to talk about smart contracts as actually being very smart. All they do is, is they execute pre-programmed steps. Yeah? I, I think if you're talking about smart, well, then you would have to be able to convert unstructured information into structured information. That's something that a smart contract does not do. It, you put into a, a smart contract a, a, a clause saying that uh, if a certain condition is met, then you perform a certain action. So, smart contracts, well, if they're smart, only in a very limited sense. Uh, are they legal? No. Most uh, smart contracts, when you come across them in, say, uh, Ethereum or Hyperledger or any other blockchain implementation, well, they just perform certain tasks. Yeah? But if you're talking about legal aspects, well, there are at least four items that you have to check in order for a contract to be legal, I would say, is that there has to be an, an offer made from one party to another. Uh, there has to be some exchange of value. Uh, there has to be an intention to form legal relations. And there must be certainty as to terms of the contract. Well, most smart contracts do not satisfy these conditions. So there's a lot of work to be done before you can call a smart contract a smart legal contract. A smart legal contract, I would say, uh, has to be automatable, it has, to be it has to also constitute some kind of enforceable agreement. Uh, has to be automatable by a computer. Not all parts of the contracts have to be, smart contracts have to be executed automatically. Sometimes there can be some kind of interactive uh, 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 control. So there has to be maybe some extra human input. 
And uh, the smart contract has to be enforceable either by legal enforcement, uh, rights, and obligations. And very important, if you're going to have a smart contract on a blockchain, of course, you want tamper-proof execution of computer code. Blockchains. Well, I don't know if you've seen this one by Dilbert. I really like it. Uh, <laughs> the consultant is just saying, oh, blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. Say, so, oh, he's a, he's a technologist and a philosopher. Uh, but I really like this one because actually, uh, you know, there's a huge focus at the moment on blockchain as a technology. And I think it's, it's, I think it's really a shame that there's so much focus on blockchain as a technology because blockchain is more than that. Blockchain is also a new way of thinking. It's about how to organize data in a new setting. Actually, it's about organizing organizations. So I think blockchain has a much wider impact than the technology alone. And that's what I like about this, uh, this setting here. Here we have legal experts, yeah, domain experts, who are, most of them are not uh, technologically oriented, and we also have the programmers. Yeah? And that's very interesting because then you get cross-fertilization and you get new ideas, new applications, and then things really start rolling. But as always in the case of new technologies, what are the possibilities and what are the risks? And I really want to tell you something about the risks. Uh, first of all, let's get some agreement on terminology. Blockchain is a globally shared transactional database. What is shared in this database are not objects, but transactions. We have a consensus technique to ensure that every node agrees on every transaction. Yeah, we're talking about a whole ecosystem of, uh, of cooperating uh, 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 processes. Transactions are placed on blocks, and each block is linked to a previous block and is placed in an immutable chain. And extremely important is that the transactions that you're putting on this blockchain, that they satisfy the so-called ACID property. ACID means uh, atomic, uh, consistent, isolated, and durable. Th these are, these are, this is a terminology from, uh, from the database context. It means that atomic means something happens completely or it doesn't happen at all. You don't have half a transaction that's being placed on the blockchain. It's either accepted or it's completely rejected. It's consistent, that means if a transaction is placed on the blockchain, it has to satisfy all of the agreements that were placed in the smart contract that governed placing that transaction in the blockchain. It has to be isolated in the sense that when you're performing a transaction, there's not somebody that can be in, that can come in between and interfere with your transaction. They have to wait. Yeah, there's, a, there's a sequencing of transactions. And durable, nothing can ever be lost. So those are extremely important properties when you're talking about blockchains. Uh, the blockchain hosts uh, execution of smart contracts. And, well, the third point is extremely important. Uh, if you do it correctly, then there's no, re no need to resort to uh, a court to enforce a legal contract on a blockchain because uh, you have an a priori, mutually agreed upon smart legal contract that binds the contracting parties. That's quite a mouthful. And uh, that's all. that also means that there are consequences. What are you getting into when you're putting a legal contract on a blockchain. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but I do know that uh, lawyers, uh, when, they, when, when a comma is misplaced or there's something that is not uh, interpreted in the right way, then you, have, you can get into huge problems. So if you put a smart contract on, on, a blockchain, on a blockchain and it's a wrong contract, the consequences can be very, very grave. Uh, what are the issues? Computers do not like ambiguity. And Terms like uh, good faith, uh, commercially reasonable, they have legal meanings, but they're extremely difficult to, contact, to grasp in the realm of a computer, which is a Boolean thing, it's a yes-no thing. Uh, meaning in a legal contract is often contextual and is subject to interpretation. Yeah? So how do you interpret a certain phrase in a contract? Well, the computer wants to interpret it in one way, or if there are different interpretations, you have to list all of the interpretations and then mention in which context which interpretation is applicable. So, yeah, the legal draft person has to be, when he's, when he's designing smart contracts, has to be more precise and more complete in order to satisfy uh, the programmer's needs. So, here we have the, the programmer. Are we not idealizing the uh, execution of the role of the programmer? Can he actually write good legal smart contracts? Well, I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give an example, a very simple one, of an escrow. 
and what the escrow contract looks like. Then I'm going to show you what it looks like uh, in a programming in programming code, and then I'm going to show you what the difficulties are. Uh, what's an escrow situation? A buyer creates a contract. That's an offer, and uh, he uh, he creates the the, the contract with payment. Um, then we have the selling party and the intermediary agent, the escrow, accepting the, uh, the offer. Now, once all parties have accepted this contract, it can, be, uh, it can be called active. The buyer informs the agent that he has received a, a certain merchandise. The agent then releases the funds to the seller. And at the end, it's always possible that someone can cancel the contract before it becomes active and then the funds are just released back to the buyer. So this is a very common situation. Okay. This is, uh, I'm going to program this, this escrow contract in Ethereum. It's, uh, it's been written in Ethereum's programming code called Solidity. The program was written by a dedicated Solidity programmer. And uh, it, the contract itself was drafted by a le legal expert. The legal expert has had very little technical expertise, and a uh, programmer, well, is a programming expert. Well, here we go. This is what it looks like. This is Ethereum code. Yeah, this, this, this. I'm not going to go through this <laughs> code line by line, but to get you an idea of what the code looks like. For people who have any expertise in programming, if they look at this code, they say it looks like 1960s programming. It's a very low level. It's very detailed. Um, when I showed this kind of code to uh, a, a legal expert, yeah, to a lawyer, and I've done that on a number of occasions, they don't understand it. I could have given them, given the con that this execution in Japanese or Greek, it wouldn't have mattered. They don't understand it. Uh, and because they don't understand it, they can't validate the correctness. Hence, the, crow, the code is prone to mistakes. So here we have this situation. The domain expert can't understand the code, and the programmer, who is not a legal expert, has to interpret the contract that is given to him by the legal expert. There's a huge gap between these two, uh, these two parties. So, uh, a huge potential for designing very bad smart contracts. And code is contract. Yeah, if you put these kind of legal contracts on the blockchain, they're going to have a legal status. And then you can get into all kinds of difficulties. So, what to do? You can, uh, you can educate the programmers to become uh, uh, more legal. You can e educate the legal experts to become uh, more <laughs> to get, be uh, skilled in program pro programming code. But what you could also do is introduce an intermediate language uh, that, can, that both can understand, yeah? in which the uh, legal expert can express his thoughts in such a way that he can be precise and complete in uh, stating his, his, his legal um, uh, expectations, but the code should also be this, this high level code should also be understandable by the programmer. Yeah? That means that they can start validating the text and they can say there's something wrong with the text. Yeah? So there's feedback, there's a real actual real understanding. So what I'm saying is there should be some kind of a semantic blockchain which abstracts from, from existing blockchain technology. Yeah? But in this semantic blockchain, we come across concepts. Yeah? We come across objects, relations between objects. We co come across ontologies, so to speak. But both parties can understand. So a language like that, uh, a good language like that, could be a controlled natural language. Controlled because it, it is machine readable. Natural language because the, the text should be human readable. Yeah? So the, li the language itself should be as close as possible to the natural language of the contracts that lawyers use. Yeah? And still, they should be able to be translated to programming code in a systematic manner. Well, I'll give you an example of what a language like that looks like. Um, the language is called uh, Olay from Objects Logic in English. Actually, it's a variant, it's a textual variant of a, of a modeling technique called fact based modeling. And what I did was I mixed fact based modeling with process modeling, and this, and in, in my case, uh, business process modeling and notation, BPMN. And this mix of fact based modeling and process, mo business process modeling gives you a language that is useful in the context of uh, drafting. Uh, legal uh, specifications. Okay, so now let's revisit this escrow example that you first saw in Solidity. 
And this is what it looks like. Yeah, it's, it's a shame that it's not, it's, okay, it might be hard for you to read, but what you're saying is we have, for example, this contract offer is um, you give a list of facts stating properties about the contract offer. It's identified by, uh, well, by, uh, by some kind of code. Yeah, it could be a number or another identification mark. Uh, it's from exactly one buyer. It's to exactly one seller. It's facilitated by exactly one agent. It concerns exactly one merchandise. It involves exactly one payment. Uh, it's issued on exactly one date. It ends on exactly one validity date. And it's signed by the buyer, by one buyer, and it's followed by, at most, one contract acceptance seller. That's the, the follow-up contract. So what you see is, first you have the offering, and then it's followed by acceptance. Acceptance by the seller. It's also identified in a certain manner. It concerns exactly one contract offer, which you've just stated before. Uh, it's issued on exactly one date, it's signed by exactly one seller, and it's followed by, at most, one contract acceptance by the agent. And here's a constraint that says that if the contract acceptance seller is signed by the seller, and the contract acceptance seller concerns a, a contract sell, uh, offer, then the contract offer is to that seller. <coughs> well, you can go on like that, and you can say, well, what does it mean that you have a contract acceptance by, a, by an agent? And what does it mean that if funds are deposited by a buyer? And you have a constraint that's saying, if funds are depo deposited by a buyer and it involves a money amount, then that money amount has to be equal to the payment amount that was also stated in the contract offer. Well, and what you see is a follow-up of all of these contract executions. And it goes like this, yeah? And we also have, at the very end, we have a stipulation that says that a contract is, is active and this is a, uh, an event condition action rule. Yeah. This, is a, this is the smart aspect of the smart contract. If a contract acceptance by a seller concerns a contract offer and the contract acceptance agent concerns the same contract offer and the funds deposited by buyer concerns the same contract offer, then it's not the case that the contract has been cancelled by the buyer or by the seller. So, here we have, at the very end, we have uh, an entity type which ends the, uh, the execution of the contract. There's release funds to seller, and it says there's an action there. Yeah, it's self-executable. This is the smart aspect. Rele release funds to seller when release funds to seller concerns a contract offer. The contract offer is, is active, and merchandise delivered concerns that contract offer. So what you have here is a specification in terms of objects, relations, logic, constraints, and firing rules, triggers, yeah, which state how the, how the contract can be smart. So, what we have here is an execution that if you, uh, it takes, doesn't take long. Most people who do not understand programming code can read these kinds of specifications. These are human readable specifications. Yeah? That means that a legal expert can say, hmm, something's wrong here. You're missing the point, or this, or this should have been added. You can talk about it, you can understand it, you can give feedback, and then in a regulative cycle, you can improve this smart contract on this high level of conceptual specification. That means the legal expert can say, at the end, when he's through validating, I trust this smart contract. Then, if you have a thing called a compiler, a compiler can translate this structured natural language, yeah, can translate it into programming code. And you can do that because this language that I just showed you is machine readable. So, if you trust your smart contract, so the legal expert says, I trust this smart contract, and if you trust the quality of your compiler, then you can trust the quality of the solidity code, for example. So, this is how this could work. Yeah? In order to bridge the gap between the legal expert and the computer programmer, come up with a, a facilitary intermediary language that is both human-readable and machine-readable. Yeah? And it's precise and complete enough to capture the semantic aspects of, uh, of legal contracts. So, this is what I want to tell you about. If you have any more questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you, uh, Hamel. And uh, just one question bef before we move on to the next speaker and then on to a little bit shorter Q&A. But uh, uh, how, how, how can we use this? Is it, is it open source? Is, it, where can we, is there a GitHub? 
yes, it's, uh, I, I, I would like to, um, been working on this language now for the last five years and only, let's say, the last a year has it come to a stage that I would really like to call it mature. Not the language itself, but what I'm really worried about is coming up with a quality compiler. Mm -hmm. Because, so, I mean, of course you can write these things by hand and that can help a lot actually to clarify what your legal thinking and to share your thoughts with a, a, a programmer. But what you really need is a compiler. Yeah. Yeah? So uh, what we have now is we have a compiler in the beta stage uh, that I, I can't release at the moment, but the people who are interested in the language itself Yes, I want to share the language with, uh, with the public. Who, who would like to test it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, you have a, a, a better user group uh, right here. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I, I just want to say, I have, I have, so I have two, um, two uh, target languages that I'm, uh, that I'm using to compile all day to. One is Solidity, and the other is uh, an exciting new blockchain uh, uh, product uh, called uh, Apple. I th I'd really like to show you this, uh, this, uh, this, this new blockchain uh, uh, product. It's, uh, if you look at Apple.io, you can, you can see this new blockchain, and it can, you can also, it's also compared to uh, Ethereum and Hyperledger, for example, so you can get an idea of what these people want to do. And one of their aims is, is not to only program in this low-level language of the 60s, but to, to produce uh, what they call an ontological shell around the blockchain so that you can also program the blockchain directly in a higher level language. Sounds awesome. Um, thank you, uh, Herman. Okay. Herman Balsas. Uh,